so I don't know if you guys were here last month when Billy spoke. So I messaged Billy today and I was like, God, I'm super nervous. And she's like, oh, don't worry. You're going to kill it. And then she's like, right before I got up there, I was about to throw up and pass out. I was like, God, I'm trying to get you to help me off the ledge. And that's the advice you're going to give me. Um, so my name is Sean Castleberry. Uh, I was born 19, September 13th, 1983. Um, I lived in Provo. And of course, I don't re really remember much. But the thing that sticks out to me is when I was two years old, my dad left. And so from two years old on, my mom was like, she was single and she worked hard to give us like everything. Um, because she was single, I spent a lot of time at my grandparents' house and I, gradu I, I gravitated towards like my uncles. One was eight years older than me and one was six years older than me. And they were like everything to me. They were my idols, you know what I mean? I watched everything they did and they taught me how to play ball. Um, I, I love sports, um, football, basketball, baseball. I, I eat, sleep and breathe with the ball in my hand. And uh, so that's how I grew up. I grew up pretty LDS. My grandparents were pretty LDS. Um, so, you know, I was raised right. Um, things stayed that way. My mom, my mom did end up getting married um, when I was six years old. Uh, my, little my, my next in line little brother was born. And the day he came home from the hospital, I was out playing in my grandma's car and it was on a hill and I kicked it in the neutral. And the car ran, I fell underneath the car and the car ran me over and I had to go to the hospital like First day home from the hospital, I'm sure my mom was thrilled. Uh, and so life was like, kind of like, like I said, my mom um, got remarried and we moved to Springville. And um, I had a pretty normal childhood. Uh, I went to school and I just played a lot of sports. Um, in fifth grade, when I was 11 years old, um, September 3rd, 1994, I was walking home from school. And when I, when I walked in the door, like my mom had this like, like ghostly look on her face. And I was like, what's wrong, mom? And she couldn't even talk to me. She was just like in tears. And I said, what's wrong? And, and she told me that my uncle had passed away from a heroin overdose. And I was 11 years old. I didn't know what drugs were. I didn't know, you know, what heroin and cocaine mix was. I just knew that uh, it had killed my uncle. And like that day I vowed like, hey, I'm, I'm never gonna do that. And so at, at 11 years old, you know, that's a pretty pretty serious trauma to go through. Like, like I said, my uncle was my everything. and. It, it hurt. I was a pallbearer at his funeral at 11 years old. And shortly after that, I think that's like when I started to rebel. Like, like I said, my mom, my mom was married. My stepdad worked a lot of graveyards, so he'd sleep during the day. And my mom worked all day. So I would go to school and I would come home and I'd do a few simple chores. And then I would just, I would run amok in, in the neighborhood. And to me, running amok in the neighborhood was playing ball until the, the sun came up. But um, for the most part, I didn't have a whole lot of rules. As long as I, as long as I was doing good in school, my mom was cool with whatever I did. Um, so at 15 years old, um, like I said, I'm kind of rebelling, and I was hang, I, I'd hang out with the older kids, and, and one of my friends um, had a, a fake ID. So at 15 years old, we're sitting on the side of 7-Eleven, and we think we're these hardcore gangsters, and we're drinking 40 ounces on the side of 7-Eleven, and the cops pulled up, and that was my first run-in with the law, and. Like I said, that's kind of when I started to rebel at 15. Um, I still stayed in school. I, I didn't really slough. Um, I smoked weed a couple times with the older kids, but I started listening to like hip hop music. And I think that had a heavy influence on, on this persona that I wanted to portray to people. You know what I mean? I thought that I was something I was, and I thought that I was this hardcore gangster or whatever. And um, I was on the football team. As a sophomore, I started varsity and uh, Playing varsity football in Springville, it kind of gives you a sense of being untouchable. You can just kind of do whatever you want and get away with whatever because you're, you know what I mean, you're varsity football. The coaches will stick up for you, whatever. So I, 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 I still went to school. I got good grades, but I was like smoking weed. I was drinking on the weekends, um, just, just kind of partying a lot. Uh, at 18, um, at 18, I... That's when like, I had enough credits to graduate. I, I thought I was doing well. So I started sloughing school. Again, I'm smoking weed, I'm drinking all the time. Um, 18 years old, like uh, two weeks before graduation, these kids are sniffing Oxycontin off the desk in, in welding class. And I was like, ooh, let me try that. You know what I mean? This will help me fit in. And man, that was one of the worst mistakes I ever made. Um, my other uncle, the one that was six years older than me that didn't pass away, we're still super close. And, He's severely strung out at Oxycontin on this time. So like I'm hanging out with him all the time and, and, and we're doing Oxycontin together and 
it's just this big party, like this beautiful life that I want to live. We're going to strip clubs and we're having hella fun and going to Vegas and doing all, and you know what I mean? I just had this like clouded judgment that that, that was the cool thing to do because my role models were doing it, you know what I mean? Um, so I got into Oxycontin and that lasted from about the time I was 18 to 26. Uh, one of the kids that I was on the side of 7-Eleven with, he passed away of a heroin overdose and he was one of my best friends. He was actually my first friend when I moved to Springville. And I remember going to his funeral and like I was distraught but the only thing I could think about was calling my dealer to meet me in the parking lot so I could numb that pain because I, I can't sit in, today I can sit in my shit, but back then I couldn't sit in my shit, you know what I mean? Um, so life kind of kind of stays that way for a while, you know what I mean? Just living a fast lifestyle, just partying, uh, no responsibilities. Like I didn't work, I was, I was good at I was good with my words and I was good at making friends so I could, I could hustle people for the things that I wanted. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't really have any responsibilities. I could live in mom's basement and I, I could just break rules and just that was, that was the way I wanted to live at the time. Um, at like 25 years old, my best friend passed away from a heroin overdose. And still at the time, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm cool, I'm not doing heroin. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm never gonna do heroin. It killed my uncle, it killed my best friend. I'm not gonna do heroin. Um, Shortly after, uh, about 27 years old, um, I met a girl. Her name was Nicole. And me and Nicole, she was like my everything. Uh, we didn't go anywhere, not together. And um, Nicole had a 10-month-old a son and when I met him. And his dad had passed away from a heroin overdose. So I wanted to, I wanted to show him that, you know what I mean? I wanted to show him what a role model looked like. And I thought that I was doing that. Uh, and me and Nicole were together for a while. And, and then Nicole gets pregnant. And, you know, I'm, it, when she got pregnant, she was pretty serious about her pregnancy. Uh, she didn't want to get high anymore. Um, but I was still getting high. And, again, I'm, I'm not functioning. I'm not, I'm not a, fu a functioning adult. I'm just kind of being lazy. I don't, I don't work. And um, about four and a half months into the pregnancy, this is my first baby. It's a really exciting time for me. Um, four and a half months into her pregnancy, she starts having complications and the doctor puts her on bed rest. She's just like bleeding really bad and, and it won't stop. So the doctor puts her on bed rest. They're monitoring her. And um, so at about five months, she, five months along, five, five months in a week, I think it was, uh, it gets super bad. And I, it's like a Tuesday night and I take her to the hospital and we walk into Payson Hospital and we're in the emergency room and they're like, oh, you're so far along, you just need to go right up to labor and delivery so you can be monitored and all this jazz. And they monitor overnight and then they sent her home and they said everything was fine. And by Friday night, it, it had gone like so far downhill, it was crazy. She, she couldn't even, she couldn't breathe. She had a fever of 104. So I take her back to the hospital and it's a different nurse this time and um, they treat her totally different. They're like, no, you need to be admitted up upstairs by a doctor. And I was like, well, wait, four days ago, you guys, told us a different story and you guys were more precautious about it. And they made her sit in the waiting room and she just like screamed in pain for like hours and hours and hours till finally she was admitted. And then when we got upstairs, they treated us like junkies, you know what I mean? Like you can't have no pain medication, you've already had pain medication. You guys just need to shut, sit down and shut up. We're doing the best we can. And I'm like freaking out. Uh, needless to say, she ended up losing the baby that night. And it was one of the hardest things I ever went through. Um, it was supposed to be my first kid. It was really hard on me. The only thing I could do was go out in the parking lot and get loaded. Uh, it's the only thing I could think about doing. Um, the only thing I could think about doing was putting on that Superman cape and, and, and taking the pain away from her and getting her loaded. So we go on this like super downward spiral. Um, still just pills, uh, a lot of partying. Um, at, at one point it kind of clicks, that, hey, maybe I, need to, maybe I need to try something different. So I go get on Suboxone. And I'm going to the doctor and I think that I'm all good because I'm getting prescribed the Suboxone, but at the same time, like I'm doing way more than I prescribed. I'm justifying it because I'm prescribed it. And then I get this bright idea that I want to go and tell the doctor I have anxiety and he, and he gives me a prescription of Xanax. So I'm like abusing those super bad, but it's okay because they're coming from my doctor. You know what I mean? I'm seeing my doctor every month, so I'm super cool. And I don't have to work because I can just sell the rest of my prescriptions and, and, and now pay my bills. And, and I lived that way for a long time. Um, and Nicole ended up getting pregnant again. And we had Braden uh, in 2012. Um, when we had Braden, 
I'm still living the same lifestyle, but in my head, it's okay because, again, I'm going to a doctor. Like, I'm holding jobs down for three to four months, and I'm, I, I'm a man. I'm supporting the family. You know what I mean? Like, again, just super clouded judgment. Um, when Nicole had Braden, she came home from the doctor, and she thought that she wasn't losing the baby weight fast enough, and so she went in the doctor one day, and he gave her this diet pill, and I come home from work, and she's, like, bouncing off the walls, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? You know what I mean? Like, what did he do to you? And she's like, oh, this is going to be great. I only have to take a half of it. He prescribed me a full pill a day, but I'm only going to take a half. And so it lasted 60 days. She was on this diet pill. And when she came off this diet pill, she crashed, like crashed and burned. I'd come home from work, and she would be, like, passed out asleep, and the baby would be screaming, hasn't had a bottle yet all morning. And I'd freak out, and I, I wouldn't want to go back to work, so I'd, I'd lose jobs. And, and that progressed into her, because she had crashed so hard, she started doing Adderall. And she thought that that was, you know, going to give her a little pick-me-up. And, and then that, that progressed to meth. And because I'm an opiate user and she's a, a meth addict, like, our lives just, they didn't click like they used to. And we would fight. We would constantly, two, three times a week, have the police over at our house. I was constantly going to jail for domestic violence. Um, I just, it would be some, like, simple, not like physical domestic violence, but some like disorderly conduct slash domestic violence where I'd spend the night in jail and then they'd tell me to go to my mom's house or something. And I lived like that for a long time until finally I told Nicole like, hey, if you leave again, don't come back. And because she wouldn't come back, I ended up being homeless. And I, I thought I was doing the right thing and I took my son to a hotel in Provo. And again, like I, I'm still going to the doctor and, and I'm getting super loaded, but I'm, I'm justifying it. And so I'm okay. And, and I'm giving my son this, like this horrible life. Um, October, October 5th, 2014, um, Nicole comes back from one of her benders and we get in this huge fight and she's in this meth induced psychosis. She grabs a pair of scissors off the counter, slashes her arm, calls the cops and says that I stabbed her. So the first thing that I can do is I run outside and try to get everybody's attention. Like, hey, look, will somebody please be a witness that I'm not putting hands on her? The cops come and they arrest me. And that, and that was the last day that I see my son. Um, I went to jail, Utah County Jail. I was there for 19 days. While I was there, DCFS came and they told me that they were going to put him in the care of her cousins. And I could, get, uh, I could get my guardianship back when I got out of jail. Um, the first thing I did when I went, got out of jail is I tried a needle for the first time. Um, I mixed it with some Xanax, and like I mentioned before, I had this persona that I was this gangster, that I was something that I wasn't, and the first thing I did is I called up his guardians, and I was like, look, you guys don't have custody. Like, I'm going to come take him from you, and there's nothing you're going to do, and if you don't let me, I'm going to kick down your door, and so it scared the shit out of him, so they, they just, you know, buried the hole deeper for me to see him, um, and that sent me in a downward spiral, like, it was that way for a while. I was in and out of hotels. I'd do what I could to get a hotel room. Um, I was homeless. Um, me and Nicole were kind of off and on, off and on, off and on. She was still doing her, her meth thing. I'm still doing my opiate thing. And then one day we decide that we're going to go try our luck in Salt Lake City. Uh, we go on the tracks, pack our bags, get on the tracks with like nowhere to go, nowhere in mind. We get off the tracks and we both land a job at McDonald's. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? I can, I can work during the day. I can stay in a hotel at night. I can party. I'm all good. Um, didn't last very long. And I ended up in the Rio Grande area. Uh, I started selling to support my habit. Um, just all day long, just walking up and down Rio Grande, working for the drug dealers, you know what I mean? And, and I picked up a distribution charge. And I'd, I'm, I was a felon at the time, so like another felony wasn't a thing to me, you know what I mean? Like they're just going to put me in jail for a while. I can do the time, whatever, it's cool, I'll get out. And it's right back to the same lifestyle. Like, I used to have this saying, when they would release me out of jail, I'd be like, APMP, catch me if you can. You better lace up your shoes. You know what I mean? And so I'd get out of jail. I'd go back to the hotels. I'd go back to Salt Lake. And I remember catching a probation violation one time, and I did like six months in jail. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to make a change. And so I got out, and I went to sober living. Um, at that sober living, Cody was my roommate. And... My, my program was still garbage. I went to meetings to pick up girls. Um, I didn't listen to what anybody had to say. Uh, I didn't work steps. I didn't call a sponsor. Um, I still didn't hold down a job. I was clean, so I was cool. You know what I mean? Like, I thought I was doing big things. Uh, I, like I said, I was chasing females. Um, I ended up getting a really good job. It was like $15 an hour, and the first thing I did when I got that job is I went to a car dealership. 
and drove a car off the lot. And I remember taking it back to the sober living house, and everyone's like, oh, you made a mistake. Like, this is going to be bad. And I was like, no, no, I got this. I got this. Don't worry about it. And uh, like a week later, I drove the car up to Price to hang out with some girl. And I came home late. And in the sober living rules, they put me on a curfew, um, a meeting a day and an early curfew. So after that curfew was over, like I was right back doing what I was doing. And the very first night off curfew, I came home late and they kicked me out. After they kicked me out of sober living, I probably made it another week before I was in Salt Lake. Uh, within like 40 days, they come and repossess the car. And I was just back in Salt Lake doing the same thing, running and gunning, um, selling to support my habit. And uh, July 17th, 2017, I'm sitting on the streets of Rio Grande and I'm like super high on Xanax and so I think I'm like untouchable and like I'm doing hand-to-hand -hand transactions and the cops arrest me and at this time it's a first degree felony distribution and I was scared shitless. I was scared shitless. I remember going to jail and I was like shit I'm done and I was sitting in jail and I was so sick that I couldn't even shut the jail door when the cop would tell me to shut the door. I was so sick. I weighed 152 pounds and I remember thinking in my head, God, I can't wait till I get better. I'm going to start working out. I'm going I'm to make a change. I'm going to make a change. And I did. I started working out. I started making a change. Um, my family was, I was calling my family in jail. And they're like, look, we're going to get you into treatment before you go to sentencing. Everything is going to be all good. So December 19th, I get this chance to go to Steps. <clears throat> and I go down to Steps in St. George. And I'm like, yes, I got this. You know what I mean? But so let me rewind. This is December. In September, September 12th, 2017, I used for the last time in jail. My birthday was September 13th, and it was September 12th I wanted to use, you know what I mean? And the next day I just felt like trash, and that was the last time I used, September 13th, 2017. In December, I go to treatment, and it's just the old Sean, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm breaking simple rules. Like, I had an MP3 player that I had got from my buddy who graduated, and I was hiding it from the counselors. I, uh, you know, was talking to a couple girls in there. They put me on a female restriction, and it just didn't, it didn't even stop anything. Um, Steps kicked me out for breaking rules. Uh, I was sitting in the middle of a group. I ha had to wear a blindfold all weekend long. I had to ask people to feed me my food. I had to ask people to help me at the gym. And they were trying to get me to sit in my shit now that I see it, you know what I mean? But I, I, like I said, I sucked at that. I sucked at sitting with myself. Um, and I was supposed to get the blindfold off on a Monday. We're in group. And I take the blindfold off to 10 APMP officers in the room. And they're like, Mr. Castleberry, you need to come with us. I was scared. Um, super scared. I remember sitting in purgatory waiting to be transferred to Utah County. And I just was sick. Uh, I went to Utah County Jail. And I sat there for a couple months waiting to see if I could get a treatment bed. Uh, my court date was on March 17th, 2018. And it was on a Thursday, and Monday morning, Ty Tyler Hansen came in. He's like, hey, we'll let you go back to steps. We'll give you another chance. We just got to get the judge to go with it. And I was like, all right, easy enough. You know what I mean? You guys do this all the time. The judge ain't going to say no to Tyler Hansen. Uh, Thursday came. I went to court, and the judge said, I'm committing you to the Utah State Prison. And that was my rock bottom. Like, hearing my mom in the background gasp, that was worse than all the pain that I have ever gone through. And... I went to prison, and I, w I was scared, but I, it was that moment in, in that transport van on the way back to the Utah County Jail that I'm like, damn, I'm going to make a change. And that's when I came up with my motto. I told somebody sitting next to me, I'm like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to never come back to this place. You watch. And so when I got to prison, I started hanging out with like-minded people, the people that just wanted to do their time and get home. I didn't want to do any of the gang shit. I didn't want to do any of the drug shit. Um, I just I worked out, and I hung out with people that were trying to do the same thing as me, that were trying to get home to their families. Um, my family wasn't on my side at the time, so I was kind of scared of what I was going to do. And about three months before I got out of prison, my family got, got on my side again. My mom, my mom never gave up on me. Uh, she started putting money on my books, so I'd call her all the time. And she's like, hey, we're going to get you into this, this house when you get out. It's called Building Beginnings. They're going to give you a job. They're going to put you in sober living. And you're going to go to this treatment program. And it's going to be 18 months. And I was like, you know what, I'll do whatever it takes. And I got out, I went to one of the Building Beginnings homes in Payson, um, and I went into this treatment program, and this treatment program was 18 months, and I was like, God, 18 months, that's crazy. Like, I've, I've been clean for over a year and two months, but I'm still going to go to an 18-month-long treatment program. And even when I got a treatment, like, 
I, I had a different mindset. Like I wanted to do whatever it takes, but I was still being stupid. You know what I mean? Like I still didn't want to put in a lot of the work. But some of the guys that I was there with, I got around those guys. And when you go into meetings and they say, find somebody that has what you want, that's exactly what I did. Um, I was still, I, I started taking suggestions from these people. Um, I wanted what they had, you know what I mean? I started working, I started getting up every day and going to a, a nine to five. Uh, no matter what, no matter if I was sick, I wouldn't call in because I wanted something different. Like I wanted to do something different that Sean had never done before. So I, I worked my ass off. Uh, about six months into that, I met an even greater group of people. I met my characters from Addicts Fighting Back. Everybody's in the house. We got the vice president right there, the secretary right there, whose birthday it is. We got the treasurer right there. And this guy, he just, he holds the votes. No, I'm just kidding. That's my sponsor. That's my sponsor. But, um, and then it just started to click. Like, my desires today to not get high greatly outweigh my desires to get high. I wouldn't give up anything that I have for the life of me. I have great relationships today. I have a best friend that can, that can say, hey, I notice you're a little bit different, and I'll, and I'll listen to him. I'll sit with that uncomfortableness. Uh, the clinician from Steps put in my in my report that ultimately got me sent to prison that Sean can't sit with his shit. And so that was one of the biggest things I wanted to change. Today, today I, can, I can be uncomfortable. I can sit up here and slow down and talk to you guys and, and, and be uncomfortable because I know that to get through it, I gotta go through it and, and just allow what happens. And that's my life today. I have good relationships. I have, I, I'm with a female that, that trusts me, that I trust her. When something's not right, we communicate. And, and if it's not, I'm okay with that. I can step away from a minute, for a minute. I don't have to have that, that begging her to stay or begging her to hear me. You know what I mean? Like if she's not okay, it's not my shit. If people aren't okay, it's, I can try to help them, but it's not my shit. Um, life's good today. It's basically all I got. Did I cut it within that five minutes? I tried to drag that five minutes out. Yeah. <laughs>